Welcome into K-State Online. I'm Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. As the Wildcats win it 59-25 to over Baylor on Saturday, K-State gets their seventh win of the season, continue to dominate here at home. I think the closest home game to this point this season was UCF, and it took a garbage-time touchdown for UCF to make it even feel close, and I think it ended up being, what, an 18-point win still? 13. So, 13. Oh, I 40, can't remember. 44-31. I shouldn't, I shouldn't try to remember that score. I just know K-State kicked their butt like they did to TCU and Houston, and now Baylor is a quick start for K-State. The offense came out guns a-blazing. They very quickly got Will Howard the three touchdowns he needed. The defense also got some touchdowns in the game. I mean, there are a lot of places to start, a lot of things to like from this game, but what's number one on your mind after the, the big win? I would say balance on offense. Uh, the defense did what they always do, a quick score, recover, and your lights out pretty much the rest of the day. Special teams problems, which is kind of typical at the moment, uh, unfortunately. In the way that they came out, like you said, um, it was a blink of an eye and they're up 35-7, to seven, which I'm glad to see, but I didn't expect to see it personally just because the heart, heartbreak that they suffered last week against Texas. Yeah, I mean, they, it felt like it was 35-7 in a hurry. And then Baylor made it a little weird there for a stretch where they got it to 35-13. They recover an onside kick, and you think, man, if they score here and then they get the ball to start the second half, like this game is not out of the way. But like you said, the defense gave up their early score. They locked in. They were able to come through. And Baylor never really threatened to make this a close game after that point. So offensively, Will Howard comes out does what he needed to do, got his touchdowns. He also had a rushing touchdown that he kind of snuck in, so he's racking them up from all over the place. Before we get into just like how he played for today, what does it mean overall to you? Because we've got we've each gotten to see these four years of Will Howard and him to achieve this record. I mean, it says something considering how many people, including myself, wrote him off pretty vigorously after the first two years. Yeah, I think a lot of us have, myself included, probably not as vigorously or as frequent – as others, but I mean, I was I was pretty mean. I called him Carson Wentz a number of times those first two years. So my apologies to Will Howard. He's far better than Carson Wentz ever is. Yeah, and what I would say is what Chris Kleiman said: resolve. I mean, that 2020 year probably wasn't fair to him in terms of what he had to do as a kid that he wasn't ready for. But Kansas State had no other choice but to go to him. Um, the ups and downs and the adversity. Some of it's you know self inflicted, and he would probably say that too. Uh, there was times where he just wasn't good enough, but at the end of the day, even though sometimes he wasn't good enough, he was still good enough to overcome a lot of those things and still find his way, you know, to the starting quarterback role. You know, he even played poorly enough at times this year to relinquish that a little bit, and that's why, you know, the team, the coaching staff went to Avery Johnson, you know, in the middle of the season here and there. But again, more resolve than I, I've said this before. And, and this is not a shot against Will Howard. I think he's been a really good quarterback at Kansas State. You don't throw 45 touchdowns in your career and break the record at Kansas State if you're not. But he runs a little hot and a little cold. And right now we're on one of those heaters that he's on where, you know, it's like last year where it feels like, you know, he's scoring 40, 50 points every freaking game, scoring four touchdowns every freaking game, taking care of the ball now. He's only thrown one interception the last four games. Sorry if you heard that. But, um, he, hot and cold, Will Howard, and but when he's on the, the hot roll that he is right now, he he's one of the best quarterbacks in the Big Twelve. Yeah, I mean he is on that roll right now. He you know he played clean against Texas Tech. He obviously didn't play a ton of that game. It seemed like even as bad as Oklahoma State was, that that might have been the bottom out point this year because he didn't play most of the game, and that was Avery Johnson who won that game in Lubbock, but. He played clean against TCU when they alternated. He was fine against Houston. Obviously, it's a slow start for the K-State offense in Austin, but he played well in that game, gave them a chance to win, and then tonight he was on top of it. So he is in the middle of that stretch. Once he got rolling last year, it was the same type of deal. When K-State finally went to him full-time, it seemed like he was in a zone all the way through that Big 12 title game with TCU. So that's a good sign for K-State offensively, especially considering the opponent next week in Kansas who can get gashed by the run. Taj Brooks ran for over 130 yards today, and you know K-State can throw the ball, but we know that they can still run, and D.J. Giddens came out, and he, he played pretty strong to start the game after a weak rushing attack last week in Austin. Another 100-yard game. He ran hard. He had the receivers continue to take a step forward as well, so you got to like uh, what you're seeing there. Keegan Johnson you know, was able to 
pick up a little bit where he left off. Not as splashy as it was last week, but a guy that's literally still finding himself. Um, but played well for the most part. Phil Brooks has had a solid few games. You really get the tight ends going. Uh, the offense, it really seems like it, you don't score 59 points if you're not clicking, right? But that is also two defensive touchdowns and a short field because of a botched punt by Baylor. What do you make of the defense and their performance today? Obviously, Baylor got the immediate score to answer. They came out, tied it at seven, made it a little squirrely there at the end. Baylor was able to get some things going on the ground. I mean, it was the K-State defense. Are people making too big of a deal if they, they're a little bit worried heading into next week's game, or is it just one of those where and you could kind of write it off because you got up so big and you take the foot off the gas? And also, Baylor, I mean, they went for it a ton on fourth down. They just were pulling out all the stops because they had nothing else that they could do. Not worry about the defense. They didn't even give up three yards of play in the first half. My only worry about the defense is actually Jay Clifton's health. We'll see if he can go against KU. No preliminary results according to Chris Kleiman, which makes me think maybe they went in for an MRI or an X-ray and they're kind of uh, awaiting to hear what, what those say. And then uh, hopefully they can dodge a bullet on any further penalty for Khalid Duke because obviously um, he went um, – a little overboard in, in his retaliation. Yeah, that was a, a, a probably the worst moment of the day for the defense was the Khalid Duke thing where he did get punched first by the Baylor player that was also ejected from the game. But like I set up to you guys in the box, Khalid Duke decided he was going to get punches two, three, four, and five in. Uh, the Baylor guy probably not only does he regret getting ejected, probably just regrets starting a fight with Khalid Duke in general because I think Khalid Duke would have kicked his butt. He won. He won. Khalid Duke won. Yes, Khalid Duke, uh, he, he won that that right there. The, the judges have scored it in favor of Khalid Duke. But you're right, that would be a big loss for K-State uh, going into next week's game, especially since you start to look around and – Jason Bean got banged up in the win or in the loss today against Texas Tech. Trying to give him a win. Well, I'm trying, you know, trying to build up the uh, excitement for the game. KU okay, couldn't do their part though. Both teams will be seven and three, but. It may be a third-string quarterback, a walk-on for KU next week. You would like to be at full strength with your pass rushers to try and make him uncomfortable and force some errors there. But if K-State is without Khalid Duke, they can probably survive. I'm with you, though. The, the injury to Jake Clifton is probably the most substantial because we saw early in the year when they missed him that they were really hoping to get him back. He struggled a little bit you know, to get back to, to his full strength, and he felt like he was maybe there. Now – one of the areas that K-State really had issues with today, and it's been a constant theme throughout the entirety of the season, it was special teams. Baylor was able to get off a couple of good punt returns. They recovered the onside kick. They had K-State beat on a fake field goal, but and they had a tight end running the route, and so just not quick enough to get fully under the ball. What do you make of the special team struggles, and, and how likely is that to really bite K-State over these next two really important games? You could. It's a problem that hasn't gone away this year. There's really no other way around it. Like you said, the fake field goal was there. Keenan Garber breaks it up because the ball hung up a little bit. You had the two punt returns, an onside kick. Not a great day, not a great day, not a great not a great season. Yeah. No, not not good for them in the return game. Treshawn Ward had a couple where it was probably the best we've seen this year, but K-State still hasn't been there. Uh, they are right now on track to have their first season without a kick or punt return touchdown since 2004. So just another element where special teams as a whole is not jiving right now for K-State. One other thing that we should probably mention because, uh, as you know, the, the message boards like to go crazy about this. The, the decision-making and the way that the coaches were able to handle the game, play calling at times, I think people got frustrated because you start so fast and then it feels like it slowed down. I mean, what, what do you make as a whole of how the game was managed today by K-State, and is there anything that happened that worries you? No, really doesn't. I, yeah. I mean, people didn't like that one swing pass, I think, on what third down to get in. The pressure was getting there. It's just an outlet pass real quick. He was open for a second. They pursued well. Sometimes the other team plays well. There was no issues. And look, Colin Klein and Joe Clam and the coordinators, they're always going to walk away and say, I could have called a better play here, could have called a better play there. There's 129 other teams that feel the same way. Yeah. 
Well, the Cats had a big day. They win it 59-25. to Get a couple of guys, their first career touchdowns. Christian Moore caught the record breaker from Will Howard. And uh, the most notable, I think, is Keenan Garber. He finally caught his first touchdown pass at K-State. And he does it on defense. Coach uh, Stuffel being two sacks, forced fumble, forced two holding calls. Big day for him. Yeah, big day for Cody Stuffel being props to him, even if he is a McPherson bullpup. How about those tiebreaker scenarios? You want to dig into that a little bit? Uh, I'll let you do it because, as I told you beforehand, I am – heavily confused on it uh, because you're telling me that I need a root for Iowa State tonight. I do not feel good about doing that. Um, so I- explain it and lay it out there for people because Oklahoma State losing today, getting their butts pounded by UCF. That, I mean, I don't. people maybe thought that they could lose that game. I don't think we would have thought it would have been that bad. But Oklahoma State wasn't ready for it. Ollie Gordon only had 25 rushing yards on the day and struggling. Yeah, I mean, he, he had a rough day. Alan Bowman played like Alan Bowman. So K-State is heavily in this race now. What, what's the breakdown? What's it look like for everybody? In layman's terms, before I get into the weeds a little bit, Kansas State doesn't want to be in a two-way tiebreaker, really, because obviously Texas beat them, Oklahoma State beat them. They didn't play Oklahoma, so not, those really don't work out. If you're in a tiebreaker scenario for second place, you want to be with more than two teams. Um, and after today, what I will say is Kansas State's chances have grown considerably. Um Obviously, you got to take care of business. You got to beat KU. You got to beat Iowa State. But you're you're in a three-way tie for second, I believe, right now, with Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. Technically, you want those teams to also win out because you don't want it to become a two-way tie. You need it to be a three-way tie. And because Kansas State and Oklahoma didn't play each other, the head-to-head doesn't matter, even though Oklahoma State beat both of them. So, and because Oklahoma State didn't play Texas, it doesn't matter what those teams did against Texas. So it goes to the next team which is a t- would be a tie between Iowa State and Kansas. And Kansas State will have a better record against those t- two teams than Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. So that's why they would win the tiebreaker scenario and go to Arlington, you know, if those things unfold like that. What I will say is Oklahoma doesn't have the discipline to really take care of bad teams, so they might lose again. Yep. Oklahoma State, I, you know, like Houston and B- BYU are probably, of the four newcomers, the two that – are the toughest to beat. And Oklahoma State just lost to UCF, and now they might not have Ollie Gordon. So I think Oklahoma and Oklahoma State is not a you know foregone conclusion that they remain undefeated. Oklahoma's in a dogfire right now with West Virginia. Yeah, and Oklahoma, I mean, they, they finish things out. They have to go to Provo next week, and then they finish at home Black Friday against TCU, who, I mean, TCU's definitely fallen off the map, but – we know that there is still some talent there, and they could maybe sneak up and get you. So it's it's not out of the question for K-State. They obviously have to take care of their own business over the next two weeks. And even if they don't you know, make it to Arlington, you take care of business. You get to nine regular season wins. You get a chance for the 10th in the bowl game. It's a pretty significant deal for them. So D.Y. is checking out Taylor Bratt, just wandering the halls of Veneer right now. He's paying no attention, though, even though I, I don't know if you were trying to get his attention, but he just blew you off if you were. So – We'll see. It's going to be a big one next week in Lawrence for the Cats and the Jayhawks and K-State. You feel really good about what they're doing right now going into that game. Obviously, they're scoring left and right. KU, all of a sudden, some questions heading into that game. Quarterback, as we knew, and uh, now they they also just had that bad performance against Texas Tech. So K-State has a lot of things at their disposal heading into the final few weeks of the season. They can make it back to Arlington if they wanted to. We'll figure it all out. We'll be back on Sunday. Myself, Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan with our postgame show. And then D.Y. and I back on Monday to tie the bow on the game with Baylor and look ahead to Kansas and see what the Sunflower Showdown has in store for this year. So, for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Cats win at 59-25 in Manhattan. Thank you for watching K-State Online.